everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, I'm Jyoti Mishra. I'm a, a faculty in the Department of Psychiatry, and I am a, a neuroscientist by training. Um, and I direct NEAT Labs, which is the Neural Engineering and Translation Labs. And I know I'm only a couple of talks away from the end of the day, so I'll try to be um, quick and prompt, and I hope it'll be interactive with some questions. Um, so I'm going to talk to you about mental health care. And, um, and in this space, uh, we know that mental health is uh, personal to the individual. Um, actually, Sujit's talk was a, uh, a really great uh, talk to come right before this because we understand that um, the way um, we feel on a day-to-day -day basis um, in the brain is interact is interactive with um, what our lifestyles are um, and also how our body interacts. So the stress levels, the sleep, the um, the nutrition that we have, the exercise that we get, um, and also our our cardiac biology is intricately related to how our brain functions. Functions. And it's a it's a two way pathway because the brain and how we feel um, on a day to day basis, if we want to get up and uh, go do our daily activities, is um, then motivates us to um, uh, take on healthier lifestyles and so on. So in the field of um, mental health disorders, um, how is all of this uh, relevant? So here. Uh, we talk about um, the problem of depression, and um, actually 350 or, four, or nearly 400 million people around the world suffer from depression. Um, related to depression are also disorders of um, anxiety-related disorders, and, um, and people may also have um, a comorbid attention deficit that comes along with these. Um, and at the same time, when we look at current treatments that are there for brain disorders, um, especially depression, the remission rate is only about 35%, which means that if you'll give a treatment to a person, um, they will the, the likelihood that they will remit, not have the symptoms later on, is only 35%. Um, and if they go in through repeat treatment, this number keeps going further down. And by the time they're trying out a third treatment, um, um, that number of remission is actually close to more like 10%. And um, so, yeah, so we need um, uh, better treatments, better mental health care. And um, one of the ways that um, we've thought about the problem, uh, actually, if you were to ever go to a psychiatric clinic, um, a lot of current practice is extremely subjective in nature. And um, you're asked about how you feel um, and mm -hmm. uh, what your behaviors are like. And based on that, a treatment plan is, is uh, what the doctor prescribes. Um, uh, of course, that doesn't happen for other aspects of your body. If you were to go to a cardiologist, you probably would get an EKG. Uh, you probably get a reading of what is potentially wrong and so on and so forth with other parts of your body. So how, why do we not have... Um, um, you know, a good measures, a quantitative measures of how our brains are performing. And so for that, to um, really to achieve that in integration, of course, our methods first need to be scalable. They need to be cost effective. We're talking about methods that can be a practice in any clinic and any clinician around the world, not just here in the United States in a specialty clinic. Um, they need to be rapid. A clinician's time is, is vital. Um, they, yet they still need to be comprehensive, telling you about different aspects of how the brain is functioning. And also um, data driven. So why data-driven because you want to know where in the spectrum of health versus ill health, where does an individual really lie? And so um, our lab's innovation has really been in the, in the space of a really developing brain mapping methods. Um, this is a wireless um, EEG, which is a, a brain sensors um, based setup that we use to map various aspects of cognition. It can be done very rapidly. It's highly scalable. It can go into any clinical setting and so on. And one can also you know, e easily get a report card for an individual as to how their different abilities are um, that we use on a daily basis. How do we pay attention? How do we uh, regulate our responses? How do we, how distractible we are? How, how, how our memories are functioning and so on. Um, all of these can be a, an output that comes out of the um, of this uh, software hardware that we've 
um, developed. And you can also get pretty pictures of how your brain's functioning. For, for the person, it's pretty pictures, but for us, it's a lot of vital data. And again, for this, you're not going into um, a, a, an expensive MRI scanner. You're actually just going to your doctor's clinic. Um, I'm not going to talk about the details of these, um, of the brain signals as such, but um, as just as a basic primer, um, the brain is like a radio, functions in multiple oscillatory rhythms, uh, low and high frequency, just like the radio communicates signals in different frequencies and you can tune into different signals. That's exactly what the brain does in terms of different parts of the brain communicating with each other and synchronizing or desynchronizing with each other and um, and one can calculate all, all these signals and also calculate them how they they uh, what is the imprint of these same signals in different disorders and to neuroscientists these kinds of patterns they mean mean a lot because we understand how different parts of the brain are supposed to be functioning in a health versus ill health, and so um, the patterns relative to depression and anxiety um, versus hyperactivity and attention and so on are really important to us. So while we while we were developing this um, scalable method for brain mapping, I, I um, came into touch with the work that um, Sujith is doing and his team is doing, and in terms of um, uh, in terms of wireless wearables using smartwatches and so on, and the, especially the prediction work that he just presented. And um, our goal here was to really say, what if um, we can really understand an individual much better um, uh, beyond the subjective level? Now we can understand how their brain is functioning. But what if we can also understand how um, uh, what their lifestyle is like, what their sleep, stress, and exercise is like. We also are interested in aspects of diet tracking. A uh, diet that is uh, really high in sugars and fats is related to um, depression symptoms as well. And of course, the the for depression, um, the benchmark is how is your mood doing on a day-to-day -day basis. So. We came up with a study where we, we can actually monitor um, brain and body health on a more holistic basis using these multiple measures that are all based on um, wireless wearable based measures. And there are we, we started to do a 30 day study. Um, we've been planning for this for, for almost a year and, and um, we've actually just launched it um, last month. And so um, I don't have you know results to present to you today, but there's a lot of promise that's that's coming up and what we one what I want to tell you about is that in this study what we really want to get at is that underlying the mental health of the individual what are the factors in terms of their lifestyle in terms of their brain and cognitive functioning what is really determining um, how an individual's symptoms appear um, and again um, as a benchmark for how um, and how Sujit has thought about the work uh, related to blood pressure, we're thinking about this similarly in that um, we can get into the space of personalized mental health prediction. Just the way um, he talked about uh, blood pressure fluctuations being determined by different factors, every individual's mental health state is also determined by different factors. and. Um, from this point, a next stage of this work will really be where we can target um, the most predictive features of that individual in, in various spaces, such as uh, brain training and brain stimulation, which is work that we do in, in, in practice um, and in our labs. And there are also sleep-based therapies that are out there, again, available on um, smartphones. There's also, of course, one can do activity tracking and, um, and and provide activity related recommendations and diet related recommendations and um, we and others have done work related to um, mindfulness based stress reduction methods as well so we have a barrage of interventions that one could um, provide to an individual if one knew what are their best predictive features for their particular um, mood states or uh, their particular mental health disorder and um, 
with that, I just want to give you a snapshot of how um, this study is coming about. This is, uh, so I bring a background in neuroscience and also in um, computational modeling. Sujit so is our partner for engineering techniques. And Dakshin um, is a psychiatrist and who is monitoring the patients in the study. And um, we just launched the study um, last month and we already have uh, 15 participants enrolled. Um, we actually do not have a problem with um, enrolling enrollment because of the uh, surge of depression that is out there in the community. Um, and um, yeah, actually many people on campus are, are looking for such treatments. Um, as such, um, uh, mental health disorders are actually also highly stigmatized. So people are uh, less willing to go to a clinic and more willing to do things on, on their own. And therefore, such treatments um, that we might recommend are also more um, appealing to them that are based off of their smartphones. Um, and the next phase of the study will be, um, will be related to AI-based prediction. And then uh, we hope to do uh, really a pilot trial with person of the personalized intervention. Um, a, a pilot trial will be single arm, which means that only we'll look at whether pre versus post we can actually clinically impact aspects of depression and anxiety. Um, and, and in future, we hope to build it as a, what, what is a clinical benchmark, a randomized control trial study, where we would, for the first time in mental health care, present a, a personalized interventions compared to the standard of care, which is completely non-personalized. And um, I think it'll be really exciting to look at how um, the remission rates turn out um, in this study. And so, um, and so really, you know, where we want to head at is the future is the tech for mental wellness, um, where we can use the wearables of today um, uh, towards more precision assessments and, um, and for the individual Build, build through the models and through the um, wearable based data, get to a state that is more um, uh, optimal for their personal well being. And so, with that, I'll, I'll end um, and share a picture of my team. And if there are any questions, I'm happy to take. Yeah. <coughs> Hi, I'm Rahele Dilmagani, UCSD alumni, and um, I work for Navy and teach at the University of San Diego. Um, I have a question. When you mentioned the frequencies, low, high frequencies, are those on the receiving side or um, because of, based on the activity we, we do? How, is it on receipt side they are generated or based on what we do? It's on, so the brain is constantly active all the time. So it's like if you were to measure brain signals, um, they, it's a time series that you get out of every sensor. Um, what neuroscience has found is that you can do a spectral transform of that data, and different frequencies are actually communicating different forms of information in how they relay signals from one part of the brain to another. And the different parts of the brain synchronize in different frequencies. And so um, it's a readout of the activity that we're capturing. It's most meaningful in the spectral transform. But does, for example, high frequency correlate to certain activities? Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. definitely. You.